Hello everybody, Ouija here. Welcome to my review of the second episode of Ruby Ice Queendom. This episode is where we start to see some of the changes that Shaft has made to the pacing and to the story of Ruby. So let's get... Let's just get... So let's get in... So let's get into this review starting with our summary. If I sound a little off, it's because I'm just getting over COVID. But I needed to get this out at a timely manner. Second episode of Ice Queendom opens with Yang forcing Ruby to approach Blake in an attempt to make a new friend. The discussion turns towards the Shinny Dust Company and their corruption. That's when Weiss makes her entrance. With some racist comments. Those comments spark an argument with Blake. Yang gets between them before it can get too bad, and we get the scene from the original Ruby of Weiss mocking Ruby's attempt at friendship. After this argument, Ozpin and Glinda show up to explain what they're going to be doing for their initiation and how teams will be decided. The first person that you make eye contact with in the forest that they are being sent into is your partner, and they need to make their way to an ancient ruin to collect an artifact afterwards. From here, it transitions to them in the locker room getting ready for the test. Weiss tries to talk Pyrrha into being her teammate before she's cut off by Jean, with some awkward flirting between Jean and Pyrrha occurring. Then we cut to the students getting launched into the Emerald Forest. This scene introduces our first new character, Xion Zaiden, who is searching for some sort of grim that hid itself in the forest. In said forest, our partners are set, with Ruby and Weiss, Blake and Yang, Ren and Nora, Pyrrha and Jean being partners respectively. After each set of partner collects their respective artifacts, they have to fight their way through a Nevermore and a Deathstalker, with Team Ruby taking the Nevermore and Team Juniper taking the Deathstalker, in a beautiful looking fight that has one of the most stunning shots in it, where they pan over each of the members of Team Ruby. The episode ends with the teams being decided. John, Nora, Pure, Ren make up Team Juniper, led by Jean for some reason, and Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang form Team Ruby, led by Val Ruby. Before it fades to black, we get a shot of this black crack mark looking thing expanding up Weiss's neck. Then the episode ends. So this episode is a lot more involved than the first one, with us getting our first interaction between the characters and our first glimpses into the changes that Studio Chef has made. Like the last time, I'm going to get into what I liked about the episode before getting into my issues. Unlike the first episode, there are some things I have some disagreements with. Let's start with the obvious stuff, like the fight scene with the Nevermore and the Deathstalker. Cause damn, this fight is great. It not only features our protagonists working together for the first time, while showing, while showing off why Jean and Ruby would later become the leaders of their respective teams, it also has one of the most stunning looking scenes I've ever seen at the ending of the fight, when Weiss and Ruby work together to finish off the Nevermore. The details on the clothes is insane, the shine of the metal is beautiful, and the way their hair flutters in the wind is mesmerizing. Each character is captured perfectly. Another detail I loved in this scene is the way that Weiss's glyph turns red as Ruby uses her semblance to help launch herself towards the Nevermore. On the other side of the battle we have Team Juniper. While not as exciting, it's still pretty cool. I especially like the way they animated Pierre's shield throw. It looks so cool. The way they had Nora finish it off was awesome as well, by sending Pierre's spear through their mouth and out its ass. Amazing. I talked about this episode being the beginning of their changes to the pacing and the story of Ruby, and it starts with the way all the characters meet each other. Unlike the original where we had Ruby, Blake, and Weiss meet at Beacon after Ruby blows Weiss up, with Blake coming in to criticize the Shinny Dust Corporation, in Ice Queendom, they combine the airship, Beacon, and sleepover scenes into one, with them all meeting on the airship after Yang forces Ruby to approach Blake to try to make a new friend. While I have a couple problems with this, which I'll get into later, overall I think it was a good change that cut out some of the fluff that the first season had. It gives the show a bit of a better pacing with the story, without having to have like two sequence changes. And I guess that's all there is to mention in my likes of this episode, it's mostly the beating of the characters which play out much like they did in the original. It does a great job of setting up the dynamics of the partners and, and gives us a good starting point for their future relationship problems and later developments, which was handled the same way in the original. Then there's the fight scene which I've already talked about, so let's talk about the things in the episode I didn't like. And unlike the first episode, there are a couple things. Let's start with the meetings. My biggest problem with this scene is the changes they made to Weiss's dialogue. 
They had way more focus on anti-violence racism. In the original show, Rice's racism wasn't really brought to light until the scene where they meet Sun. In this, they leave with it. I understand why they made these changes. I just, I just don't know if I like it. Next, let's talk about the Weiss meets Pierre scene. Because they made some changes here as well that I both like and dislike. So this scene starts with Weiss approaching Pierre about being teammates, with Pierre getting noticeably uncomfortable after Weiss mentions knowing who she is. I love this. It makes sense. Pierre's biggest desire is to be treated like a normal person, not some larger than life figure. And here's Weiss approaching her like this larger than life figure, exactly what she doesn't want. A change I didn't like is the way they incorporated the Jean stuff. In the original, Jean starts to get a little too into Weiss's personal space, so she asks Pierre for some help. In this one, it's Weiss who sends Jean away just to be rude. They made Weiss somehow worse in this than she was in the original. Then there's a scene where Jean mentions that he was never a fan of the pumpkin feet cereal, which makes no sense. Since he has a pumpkin peat jacket under his armor, that he collected a bunch of box tops to get. This is kind of a minor detail, but still. Finally, let's talk about the three scenes that they took out from the original show that I didn't like being taken out. First being Ruby and Weiss's first interaction. This scene gives Weiss a reason for her dislike of Ruby. Without this scene in it, it just makes it look like Weiss is a massive jerk to Ruby for absolutely no reason. Following up on that is another Weiss scene, one where she saves Ruby from the Nevermore. This scene really shows that despite everything, maybe Weiss isn't that bad of a person. They do have a minor version of this later on in this fight scene with the Nevermore during the launch scene, and we'll probably talk about that more later. Final thing I didn't like being taken out was the introductions of Nora and Ren. That really set up the character dynamic between the two characters. Instead, they are thrown into the back worse than they already were in the first three seasons. So I have a lot more mixed feelings on this episode. While I like the fight scenes and the pacing of the episode, with them cutting out some of the fluff, I have mixed feelings on the changes they made to the character interactions. On one hand, I don't like how they only focus on Weiss's negative traits and moments, while getting rid of her more positive ones, as well as getting rid of her reasonings for not exactly being thrilled to be Ruby's partner. On the other hand, I can understand why they made these changes, which I will talk about more in depth in my review of the third episode, because there are more changes to Weiss's parts to come. One of the bad things about this episode is that it might require a bit more knowledge about the show with no real introduction to Ren and Nora. New fans will be a bit indifferent towards them. I think overall I'd give this episode a 7 out of 10, it's still good, just not as good as the first one. So like I did before, let's start from the beginning and work our way through the episode. The first thing up is the way they had all the characters meet, specifically on the dialogue between the four. This scene both incorporates dialogue from the original show, while also adding new stuff. We get the classic lines like Ruby's spiel about friends and Weiss's sarcastic remark, but we also get a change in who criticizes the Shinny Death Corporation. In this version, it's both Yang and Ruby who bring up the rumors of their, let's say, poor treatment of their workers. I like this change, as it brings Yang and Ruby more into the conflict that will eventually happen between Weiss and Blake. I guess it also gives Weiss a reason to dislike Ruby, as she criticizes her family, and the company she is set to inherit, though it's not a very sound reason. Well, not as much as almost killing her like a new This leads into Weiss's first racist remark of the show, with plenty more to come in episode 3. And Blake's counter-argument, that almost sounds like her line to her later about good and evil. Here she says, if you think that all fallen are evil, you're ignorant. I don't know if that's an original line or it's a new line. Um, I have to rewatch the first season. I have mixed feelings about this scene. On one hand, as a Weiss fan, I don't know if I like how much they are focusing on Weiss's racism, which gets even worse in the upcoming episode. On the other hand, this sets up the coming conflict between Blake and Weiss about the White Fang in episode 3 better than the original did, where Weiss's racism kinda comes out of the blue while they are chasing Sun, a scene we'll definitely be looking at in episode 3. For this moment, she never really mentions the White Fang or even the Fonz, at least not in what I can remember about the show. Let's move on from here to the scene where Weiss and Pyra meet. Weiss approaches her to recruit her and name drops her in the middle of the conversation. I actually love the way that Pyra's face flashes from disappointment to annoyance to her usual happiness. But you can tell that the smile is more of a polite smile than anything. I personally think that this one frame better shows Pyrrha's thoughts on her celebrity status than most of the original show did in her first three seasons. Uh, you can really tell that she is disappointed when Weiss knows who she is, and that's the reason she approaches her. <clears throat> on the flip side, when Jean shows no signs of knowing who she is, you see surprise on her face. And then the eventual smile after she learns that he does in fact not know who she is. 
before Weiss sends him packing, which is another change they made that makes Weiss look way worse than she did in Volume 1. And she's pretty bad in Volume 1. Next, we have the scene where Weiss and Ruby become partners. This scene plays out much like it did in the original, with Weiss criticizing Ruby's age and maturity. The part I really want to focus on is Weiss's reaction to Ruby calling her perfect. The way Weiss's face contorts in pain as she recalls her past failures, you can clearly see the effect that her want for perfection, as pushed by her father, has had on her. The stress that it puts on her to try to become the perfect Schnee. This is a really nice addition as opposed to the way she just sort of brushes it off in the original. Of course, this was only possible with the specifics of Weiss's relationship with her father, which might not have been fully developed when Volume 1 came out. It also shows us the method that Weiss uses to combat her insecurities, which is putting on this prickly personality as right after stating she's not perfect, she immediately insults Ruby. She uses insults to keep people from seeing what she doesn't want them to see, her imperfections, because she is afraid of them seeing her vulnerabilities due to how her father raised her. There is something else in this scene that I missed the first time I watched, this, but I'll circle back to that later. This new version of the scene also makes Weiss look a lot more competent, with her killing a bunch of the Beowulfs in addition to setting the forest on fire, so they didn't have to run from them. Not completely, at least. I mentioned in my review that while they did remove the scenes where Weiss saves Ruby from the Nevermore, instead choosing to have her say Pyrrha to further push that obsession she has with Pyrrha due to, I think, Weiss viewing Pyrrha as the perfect person. While they did remove that, they did give Weiss a scene that lets us know that maybe she isn't so bad. This happens right before she launches Ruby at the Nevermore, when Ruby talks about showing off her moves, so Weiss knows she can fight. Weiss responds with a compliment, telling her she already knew that, and probably one of the most genuine smiles we've seen on Weiss's face. The last thing I want to talk about is the final scene and everything surrounding the new plotline that they seem to be building to. At the end of the episode, we get a close-up of Weiss's neck, that has some sort of crack growing up it. When I first saw this, I was both shocked and ecstatic, as it means that something from my theory was right. In my theory, I stated that if this was a nightmare of Weiss's creation, it would be caused by a Grimm, which is what we're seeing here. How do we know this? Aside from the fact that it's brought up in the next episode. Well, let's talk about the new character that they introduced in the Ozpin launching the student scene, Shion Zaiden. Firstly, I really like the design for this character. The purple and white coloring and then the goth witch look is great. Some interesting things that I noted about their clothes are they have a keyring that seems to be designed with what I think is an upside down four as well as some full of teals on her shoes. And their sash has moons and stars on it, bearing her connection to the new Grimm. They talk to Ozpin about it being in the forest. We get two hints here at what the Grimm is doing, both of which I missed during my initial watch through, which makes things in the next episode make way more sense. The first is when Weiss, Ruby, and Jean meet up, and we get to see through the creature's eyes, where it looks at Weiss, then looks at Jean, before the screen zooms in on Jean. Then we actually get to see a glimpse of it, well more than likely a different one, in the Weiss and Ruby scene. After Weiss kills the Beowulf, so you can actually see it slithering by, likely stalking its next victim. When the final fight is over, Shion mentions that the Grim has found its hiding spot, and it's time to get to work. Which during my initial watch, or before I watched the third episode, led me to believe that the Grim attached itself to Weiss and made me happy because it meant that my theory about it being caused by a Grim was right. While I have my personal problems with this episode, I will admit that all the changes that they made to the show, for the most part, help the story flow better. Not only do they help better set up conflicts for the future, they will also contribute to a slightly more complete character arc. Overall, this episode is still a very good follow-up to the first, with one of the most stunning shots in it. If you liked this video, give a like and subscribe. And tell me what you liked and disliked about episode 2 in the comments below. Ouija out.